Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Alright, here we are on another episode of Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction podcast. So today, the topic that we're going to be talking about are, um, is choreography in its various forms. Uh, so that might entail a fight scene or you know, potentially a car chase and also uh, will extend to sex scenes. So uh, we're going to be having some very in-depth uh, discussions about those specifics. Mm-hmm. Lots of fun. Multiple entendre. So many entendres. <laughs> so many entendres. Um, okay, so before we do that, though, let's let's see what everyone's been um, reading and writing. Do you want to introduce us? Oh, yes, I certainly do. Yeah. Uh, so we introduce we, us. Burnham, Hello. Uh, Patty Boylan. Howdy. Phoenix Rag. Hello. And I am, of course, Alex Eldridge. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um. So uh, I'll start with you, Ali. Uh, yes. Yeah, what, what have you been reading and writing recently? The obvious answer of Moby Dick. That's not completely true. I've, I've started reading other things, which is actually bad. I don't, I usually like finish something before I pick up something else. At the moment, I kind of have like three books on my lazy Susan of reading books. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Shankari Chandran, has been published by Ultimo Press. Oh, yes. Her yes. book which is uh, Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens. Um, so I've been reading her book and it's just delightful. It kind of, it wants to capture you with this quite whimsical voice because it's setting a nursing home in Western Sydney. Um, so you're like, oh, this is going to be a bit of a comedy on the front, but then it actually is going to hold you down with themes about Sri Lankan uh, diaspora and some quite really serious topics that are handled just beautifully and elegantly. Um, awesome. So very, very excited that it's, you know, a local book is published and it's doing really well. Um, otherwise, yeah, Mo- Moby Dick continues. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the hunt for the great white whale continues. <laughs> um, okay, P- uh, Patty, Patty Boylan, what have you been reading and writing uh, or, you know, experiencing recently? Ooh, experiencing. That's, <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, same as Ali, um, Moby Dick, but also two other things as well, because uh, I don't know, you need uh, other things when you're reading the classics. Uh, so I'm reading a piece of nonfiction at the moment called Sapiens. It is by, I've got his name here, Yuval Noah Harari, who is an Israeli writer. And it's kind of like the big history of humankind. I don't know if he's an anthropologist or what, but he's trying to tackle like the entire history of the whole human experience from like how evolution through to all the various agricultural revolutions and technological revolutions yeah it's very interesting it's very sweeping in its scope um yeah i'm learning a lot still in still in prehistory at the moment which is sounds like it's it's on par with uh, moby dick in terms of nonfiction. it's an it's an epic it's definitely an epic uh that and the manga berserk which i've heard very good things about yeah it's a lot of fun it's um i need to find a new translation though like the, the translation is really bad and mm. it's kind of ruining the experience mm. for me. Uh, writing, I've just finished the draft of the story that I'll be producing for the anthology that we're writing because we're all part of an anthology group and that's mm. coming out sometime in the future. Uh, yeah, that's me. Cool. Uh, Phoenix, what have, you been, uh, what have you been looking at? Still, well, first of all, I feel like I should start reading Moby Dick or something. It seems like it's what's going around. Give me the running um, joke of the podcast. <laughs> it really will. Uh, I'm still making my way through Lord of the Rings. I'm almost done with book two now. Um, and a, cu- a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, me and my partner uh, started re well, it was a reread of Slaughterhouse Five for me, but we were reading it out loud to each other. Awesome. Um, mm-hmm. And that was a fun revisit. It's very uh, good, and then Sorry. Oh, I just said it's very good. It's one of my favorite books. I oh, it's it. very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just finished watching a sitcom called Shit's Creek, which I commend right. for its character development and character yeah. growth. It does it so well. Very good payoff. Very satisfying. Everything. I watched it in 
a documentary about the making of it and someone said it was well earned and I loved that I was like you feel like you earn it like you yeah. get to the end and I felt like I accomplished what they accomplished <laughs> so very good writing in that in that regard that's awesome I have heard very good things and seen a couple of episodes here and there and it is it is very funny but also like oddly wholesome so I, oh, it's so wholesome yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it a lot. Uh, and personally, I have been, I just finished uh, just recently at the, at the gym because I tend to audiobook a lot of things. The Trouble with Lycan by um, John Wyndham, who uh, basically it's about if, if people found the, the Holy Grail uh, and wait, no, is it the, um, the Sorcerer's Stone, you know, the, the, the thing to, to everlasting life or massively extended life. And it wasn't so much about that and, you know, what that would look like. It was more about, oh, how are we going to be able to present this to the public in a way that, like because it's a limited supply and the way that it won't like everyone won't kill each other. So uh, that focused more on the political aspect of it, but it, it wrapped up quite well. I don't know if anyone's read any of John Wyndham's stuff, but it's very, it's very hard sci-fi, uh, but but very very good. That one was a little a little headier than most of what he does, but um, thoroughly thoroughly recommend it. Um, and I also just finished um, a short story by Robert E. Howard, which I'm actually going to read a, a piece from uh, his uh, Conan the Barbarian series. And um, as I said, we're going to be speaking about action choreography sort of stuff. So that does that very well. Uh, so that, that'll be a nice little um, example of what we're doing. But getting into it, action. Um, I keep saying action. I should say choreography. Choreography in general. Yeah. In terms of things that happen. So my question to, to everyone, so we can start, is what is the purpose of action? And I certainly have my my own idea of what I think we, we do with it. But what do we all think? Um, maybe I'll just round Robin again, but I'll go the opposite way this time. So Phoenix, what, what do you think is the purpose of action in, uh, in you know, written fiction? Uh, this is honestly <laughs> something I've never glad actually wasn't me to thought start about with. before. Odd. I've never <laughs> thought about this. Like the actual, like the like large scale purpose of it. We can get really Actually, deep before... into the armchair philosophy here, I think. <laughs> I've, got, I've got armchairs. I can mm -hmm. see like little... mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, right before we started recording, I started thinking, I had to think like, have I even written what I would consider an action scene before? And I have, I, I recalled one that was very quick time. And it feels like, um, it's almost like, so if based off of that, if I had to categorize it's like purpose, it's like writing is throughout writing, you're basically expanding and contracting time based on the importance of events. If you're recounting a large amount of like on a large scale, you're covering large chunks of times and you're more so, um, I don't know, you're kind of dialing it way out. You have room to play. But if in a particular moment, uh, the details become very, very, important on a very fine grained level you kind of need to zoom in and the action becomes closer together so it's a way of delivering like bullet time in the moment events uh, when your character's senses need to be dialed way up when your character needs to be aware of everything that's going on which is not always the case totally um and very rarely, I would actually say they need to be aware of everything on that fine of a grain. Otherwise, it gets too bogged down and it's way too heavy. So sparingly, it's really great to bring the reader right into the breath of the moment, like right into the like breath by breath, beat by beat moment and show that it is possible. Damn, um, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's very and I, I, I've honed in on your word show, Phoenix, because when Alex threw that bomb of a question out I genuinely had to sit here and be like how would I answer that because yeah. um, <laughs> being screenwriter first I really struggle to separate action from story in my brain um so what do you, when what do you mean by that what was separate the... action from story well it was just when Alex asked he's like what's the purpose of action um why have it and I'm kind of like because you don't have a story without it like my brain started like not working because I'm like yeah. what do you mean it's a yeah. story um, does, not <laughs> does not compute um, and I, I, I took a step back while Phoenix was talking to be like well why why did I have that melt mini meltdown and and for me is the the very overused sense of show don't tell isn't it um, for me action is the show it is the it is ideas actualized so in the same way a novel needs to be equal part ideas and then it needs to be then demonstrated through action and kind of whatever the healthy mix of that back and forth is. I think some 
genres, um, the promise will be weighted towards more action, less on the ideas, and then mm. other genres will be more ideas heavy, less on the action. Um, but I think there always needs to be that sense of idea introduced and then the demonstration of action, of the idea in motion. Mm. Yeah. Based off of that, it's almost like you could say the opposite of action would be exposition, like straight exposition. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good that's a good spectrum to think of it of. Like my my personal interpretation of it is, and I love that we're we're all getting such different ideas from this because I've I have definitely one specific thing that I'm like this is this is what it means to me personally. I it's really really easy for me to get bored by action. Um, like I so. I'm trying to think why exactly, but ba basically if, if things start exploding, I've got maybe 30 seconds where I'm really engaged. Like for example, the, the, the car, the car chase in, in Batman recently was one of the, one of the very few moments when I can think, no, I'm actually on the edge of my seat for every part of this, which is pretty rare for me. It's like, car, I do like car chases to be honest, but, but um, yeah, the, I, I tend to find I have a very limited uh, amount of time that I can pay attention to reaction before I start drifting off. But Characters talking, for example, I can watch for hours. I can watch a whole movie, just people like chatting. Like Birdman, for example, mm. I was just absolutely hooked every second yes, of that movie. Birdman. Yeah, mm. loved it. So, good. so for, good. Me, for me at least, I, and I don't think this is a universal, I think this is just a personal thing. For me, I like to approach any sort of action or choreography as a payoff, as sort of a release for this buildup of tension that's happened, which is not so different to what you said, Phoenix, in terms of the, the, um, the dilation and contraction, so, you know, things expand out and attention builds and builds and builds, and then it sort of sucks into one moment. And you know, mm -hmm. I mean, look in, in obviously in relating a sex scene, that's that's about as literal as that can be. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it is it is a release of tension in in a sense. Is how well, I, I simply jump in here. I hope that's okay because it, um, I. I love thinking about sex scenes and fight scenes as quite parallel, not so much in yeah. craft tools, but in the idea that, so I've grown up watching a lot of shonen anime um, and also a lot of like WWE wrestling. Um, and I mean, I hope you guys can vouch, but I, I actually quite pride, I pride myself on my fight scene. I really enjoy mm. writing my mm. fight scenes. Um, mm. And I think I write okay fight scenes. Yeah, um, they're clear, and, which isn't always a given. Yeah, I clearly no. know what's going on, and that's yeah. yeah I have almost... an example of where that doesn't work, but sorry. <laughs> but but this idea of the build up and release is basically the entire arc of what a shonen anime, like its story engine, runs off. It's what is idea. shonen? Sorry, sorry, I keep interrupting uh, you as well. Even. So so shonen is defined by the age group, which is more the younger male. Uh, fans of anime so, so like anime likes to divide itself into a quadrant being like young male older male uh, I'm going to forget all the specific names but shown is the young male it that's probably the genre that's transported to the west mm. um, the easiest because that that's our superhero genre a little mm. bit so we absorb that really well um, but basically that's the genre that you're going to get a lot of fun scenes and it is built structurally about the idea of you're going to set up a bad guy early and you're going to have an entire season that's going to build up to the promise of the fight scene. The mm. fight scene is going to be beat out potentially over many episodes in that mm. the, the fight scene will have its own inherent turning points and structure. And I can't tell you how much I love that and love mm -hmm. being able to replicate that in literature. Mm -hmm. And it's the same reason why I love wrestling so much, because to me that mm -hmm. like it's a choreographed fight and it is this dance, but it has inherent story beats. You have hour long wrestling matches. So mm -hmm. like, how do you achieve that is because it's hanging on narrative thread. Yeah. So you've had like mm -hmm. weeks and weeks of build up um, of why these two people are in conflict. Um, and the audience comes in knowing what their special move sets are and whether or not they've been leveling up in their skill sets. This is also like an anime trick as well mm -hmm. that you go on the journey for them to level up. Usually their leveling up is also tied to their emotional, like if they have an emotional lack they need to solve, they can't level up until they solve the emotional lack. Then they get a power up, then they can go into the fight. Sometimes that happens during the fight, um, but wrestling does the exact same thing. And then it's it's just that long, long build up and release. Um, 
And I wanted to segue that into what I've been writing at the moment. I haven't actually been writing a fight scene. Um, I've been thinking more and more about sex scenes and how they parallel that in a, a your more dedicated romance genres, yeah, not totally. not mm. not a sex scene that would just happen as a stylistic gratuitous element of another genre. <laughs> I, I don't know why I immediately thought of like a crime novel that might want to have like a grungy sex scene, but that, that's more of a set piece rather than a, a narrative yeah. build up and release. Um, True. It so in, in my, yeah, in my, his, uh, I'll end my rant shortly, um, but in my historical fictions, um, I the first book I have a couple of fade to black sex scenes because I never really wanted to go there. Yeah. um creatively um and i never actually felt the narrative reason why it would be justified to go there i'm like the audience the knowledge that that is a sex scene is enough nothing is going to happen on the page that's actually going to change character or story so i don't need to write it out um i've only recently had a crack at like writing a sex scene for that series and it like on the page um and and later i can talk about kind of the the craft of how I tried to go about that and teach myself that but the reason I thought that one was justified as opposed to the fade to black ones um was because this is like 40k words in the making like it had mm -hmm. been structurally embedded in the build-up it would almost be like breaking the promise I had made yeah. to the audience if this one wasn't followed through with as opposed to the other ones was my logic mm -hmm. I mean it's it's an interesting point you make about the, because when you yeah, well, like when you when you approach sort of a shonen and then like a romance novel, uh, look whether that is is a, um, a steamy or more a cozy. No, what's, what's the other term? Like cozy or classic or like uh, sweet, sweet romance. Sweet, yeah. Sweet. So I've I've read a few of them because because my girlfriends like pushed them on me and I've been like, fine, I'll no, I'll have a go. I'll, I'll give it a crack. Um, but you're right. There's that parallel of the tension that goes up. Obviously. On one hand, it's it's sexual tension. On the other hand, it's it's the tension of oh, is he going to be able to like? Are they going to fight? Are they going to kiss? It's literally that that parallel between it. I so, love that parallel so much. Yeah. So so it's it's an interesting sort of um, like it, it's basically just just two two maybe inverse demographics. Like you know, like mm. like a I don't know, maybe a. Well, I guess the opposite of, sh I'm trying to think in terms of the, uh, the, the anime quadrant, but look, basically people reading an action-based book, uh, you know, which would be, a, yeah, let's say a superhero thing, and then a sweet romance, they're probably going to be the same age demographics. And essentially they're, the, they're these two arcs that are sort of paralleling there. Um, so yeah, no, I just think it's an interesting, um, an, an interesting, interesting parallel to make there. And I think it's quite valid. Mm. Um, Patty, you haven't said much. What do you, what do you make of all this? I said a lot of, Mm. Yeah, mm. and interrupting Ali. Very well timed. Mm. Thank well. you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, when I thought action, I immediately thought fight scenes. Like I suppose everyone did. All I suppose action can be anything. That's I said kinesthetic before. I'll say it again because it's a lovely word. Um, I think there's something really like the first stories were physical. I think there's something really primal to both fight scenes and sex scenes and action. It's storytelling without words i think it's powerful because i'm getting kind of philosophical here it's innate and deep and kind of animalistic and almost primal when when we read a fight scene i think it speaks to there's like the life and death struggle that's immediately there like the stakes are never higher than when there's a car chase and there's a chance of death or a gun battle and there's a chance that someone's fought so it's powerful immediately in that sense because it's it's the most important thing we can experience. You know, like we're being chased by the lion in the savannah at that point. You know, it's gonna always make our adrenaline rise and our interest immediately switch on. I guess same with sex. Sex is the other side of physical action. Um, we're talking about like exposition and sex is kind of opposites i almost feel like it's a triad you've got dialogue you've got ideas and then you've got action and all of these tell stories been very different ways yeah no that, that's interesting that you bring it back to a craft way of how to actualize the action um so in prep for this sex scene i wanted to write i, I kind of 
away and asked myself what are some sex scenes I've read in literature um, that I actually liked. Um, like we know about all the notoriously terrible ones on the internet. Like I'm pretty sure there's a prize, like an award out there that will like have a short list of the worst sex scenes in literature. I only learned about this recently. It's It's amazing and eye opening. Oh, that's phenomenal. And unfortunately gendered. I'll take you, let you guess which direct, which gender is responsible for writing some Mm. of the worst, (laughs) um, sex scenes. Uh, (laughs) Breasted boobily. Has anyone seen that? (laughs) Uh, no <laughs> it's like a it's, it's like a male writers i think it's a, twi- a, a a reddit thread male writers writing about female anyway it's just that's mm-hmm. the tagline <laughs> mm-hmm. um uh, but yeah i so, so i went away and did some research and, and a book i absolutely adore is called swords point by i believe it's ellen kushner krishna uh, we'll make sure i check that um when we put our details up um but I, that has an absolutely beautiful sex scene in it because it actually takes a step away in that it's not, you know, blow by blow in terms of like an action sense. It's, it actually kind of, yeah, thanks, Alex. You've done like the drums to dunch for people who are just listening. Um, but it, it wants to be a bit more metaphorical. It wants to kind of talk about sensations and feelings uh, without actually... Uh, being too descriptive in what's actually happening like you don't get us to the environment like it's Mm. in in writing we're often told we need to like ground the audience in the moment make sure they can you know visualize the room feel the room see the room like you're in the location the 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 choreography of the moment but this sex scene decided to it stripped it all back um, to do the opposite in that it was just focusing on um, just uh sensation that wasn't necessarily tied to action thoughts that weren't necessarily tied to action um and and so you just got this wonderful impressionistic sense of the sex scene which is almost the opposite of what we said was the dif- mm. the difference between exposition and mm. action if we're if we're mm. justifying sex scenes as choreography it was this wonderful sex scene that had very little choreography that's more clever cuz it also kind of pgs it like I think at least me, one of the things that would make me steer away from writing a sex scene, and I never had, would be, would the audience, would an audience that doesn't want to read a sex scene be immediately turned off by this? Because it's taboo. Like there's almost nothing, well, almost nothing more taboo. But if you just write about the experiences and the sensations, you can write the full breadth of the sex scene without ever having to mention a dick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, and, and I enjoyed this, enjoyed, yeah, um, this experience much more than I, I've uh, written one for a screenplay once before. And uh, craft wise, screenplays don't give you access to emotions and thoughts. You're only describing mm. literally like mm. this happens, this, it looks like mm. this, this happens. So I, I've tried to write a screenplay sex scene and, um, and that in terms of like a writer getting something out of that wasn't a very enjoyable experience. I'm like, how do I make this sound not dumb and awful on the page and communicate like I know once it's filmed it could look quite elegant um what I was trying to do but it's always to me going to sound real silly on the page (laughs) what I'm trying to describe bodies being where and it was I I didn't enjoy it well I think that's why I wanted to have a crack at this other um I I just I wanted to challenge myself to try and level up because it it felt like a much more poetic technique than I'm used to writing um Mm. I feel like I can I write quite spare prose most of the time is my natural style like no I want to try and write this kind of indistinct impressionistic sex Mm. scene and that was like a a, a writing challenge I gave myself nice well well, that's a good uh, good thing to bring up like the the ability to um write something that is heavily action oriented uh, in more of an impressionistic or abstracted sense and when that would be appropriate and when it would I imagine that I I would be imagining that that would be a maybe not a common tool but more common in say literary fiction um, because it does lend itself to that sense of mm. well this is this is going to be artistic and yeah maybe a little more impressionistic and um you know, it's more about the, the the words than necessarily like getting every specific action down. So I imagine, uh, is this is the book you're describing, is it more in the literary fiction vein or? It, it's, 
it gets lumped in with fantasy, even mm. though it technically doesn't have any fantasy elements. It's just because it's like second secondary world historic, like medieval. You know how some oh, people just I love see. those yeah. those fiction books. That it's like, oh, it's a fantasy setting, even though there's magic in this world. So wow. it, it's called Swords Point, and it's all about upper class duels. So there's lots of dueling action as well. This book is actually another great example for some well written fight scenes mm. um, because of that. Um, I think it has been given a lot of praise for being like a higher literary example of that genre um, than is common. Yeah, and th that's that's an entirely different conversation, you know, talking <laughs> about the, the literary ghetto that our respective genres sort of fall into by default. It's like, oh, it's it's not of this world. Oh, it must be a bit shitter than, than most of the other stuff. And it's like, okay, well. <laughs> you know, well, I feel like that ghettoization, as certainly as self-publishing expands, is is. Uh, but anyway, that's an entirely different uh, topic. It's, um, yeah, but it's sounding. Sorry, I, I completely just started talking oh, over you. Go ahead, Alex. I was just going to say, can we think of any any particular uh, choreographed scenes, action scenes that we've written that we are particularly proud of? Uh, that you know, it, like it, exist. That we'd like, you know, that we'd like to describe as as good examples of how to to effectively choreograph something. Um, I can think of an example that I thought went well, and uh, it was recently for the story that I'm writing for the anthology. And hmm. uh, listeners, we're all giving each other feedback, which is a wonderful process. Yeah, Having like good. a circle to get feedback from, really yeah. good. Uh, so this scene is a scene of violence, and it's really one sided violence. It's one side is basically committing a massacre against another. And I wrote it deliberately in a way that was quote unquote passive voice. So it was like almost quite detached from the action. Uh, it wasn't, it was almost describing the act, the violence as happening uh, rather than the character. It, was, it wasn't describing the characters having violence done to them so much as the violence being done to the characters and not violence being done by a character, but just violence is inflicted. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm just going to keep bumping. Yeah, yeah. As, as opposed to the as opposed to the individual characters themselves being like he, his, yeah. his, his flesh was, it was just because of the perspective thing. I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing I had in my mind while I was writing it is going back to anime you know when there's like a sword fight in anime and the scheme screen will suddenly cut to like black and you'll see like a slash of red across the screen yeah and it doesn't mm. show the samurai actually cutting the guy in half it just shows the impressionistic slash marks which somehow is more powerful it makes the slashing itself the the, the, the subject yeah anyway yeah. so i wrote so the scene some of the feet almost why, why why well I'll, I'll you finish i'll, okay. I'll say it but and some people are like, yeah, I get it. Like, the, there's no fight to be had. This is just a slaughter. Like, I get why you're using that. And some people are like, don't use the passive voice. It's, uh, you know, it make it robs the characters of their agency. Uh, the, all of the reasons why you wouldn't have passive voice. So that was my experience. Not sure what to make of it. But, um... <laughs> So the reason I got excited when you said the samurai slash is because that's mm -hmm. literally the image I had in my mind when I was thinking to an action scene I'd written, which I just recalled a different one. It's not characters fighting or it's not conflict in that way. It's actually a short story I wrote where the character uh, transforms multiple times and any time they transformed, that's a very blow by blow moment. And I wanted to do it in a way where I'm not specifically calling out like, and then their arm did this and then their leg did this. Cause I was like, that's so boring. And like, it's like itemized and it's not actually gonna come off well. I wanna capture the sensation of transforming and what that would mm -hmm. feel like. And the image that came to mind in, an like I also compared it to anime action was when samurais are fighting and they go by and it's not so much what you said with the black screen and the slash, but I pictured when they pass each other. Yeah. And they're and both that like moment their when swords are- <laughs> Yeah, there's that moment yeah. where nothing happens and then you see the result. It's almost yeah. like that's kind of how I went about it by saying like, I described the way the world warped around them and I described mm -hmm. it how their perspective shifted. And then yeah. I revealed what had happened to the reader after it had happened. Yeah. And that's it's almost how like I focusing on the moment that is that, like the characters mm -hmm. are almost less important to the self-contained moment that is the swords slung exactly. across each other. Like yeah. The violence yeah. becomes the character itself. Or the yeah, chain. yeah, I really dig that. 
yeah, yeah. yeah mm. no, I love that as an example because I was trying to sit here and think of is so we talked about like the impressionistic sex scene is the is there an equivalent of the impressionistic fight scene so yeah. I, I love that mm. you've both written that and I was trying to think of I, I've seen it done in like I feel like big battle scenes in high fantasy will do this with the lens if like a, if they're trying to imply like a long arduous ongoing battle it becomes less blow by blow and it will zoom out to focus or, or actually zoom in potentially really tight on just how the character's feeling exhausted uh, just small minor cuts with but explaining where the cuts have come from or what's happening. Suddenly they're in the mud because they've fallen over. Like it will go for this very disorientating sense of not actually mm. explaining the action in great detail. Um, but I think, but then when it comes to a boss battle, there is almost the, again, promise to an audience that you are going to get more of the this, then this, then this, then this. Um, I'm trying to think of, I, I think Brandon Sanderson does this really well. He, he'll he do both the um, larger, uh, like not honing in on detail version, as well as then when we get a boss battle, we will get the very fine tune action. Every beat is beaded out and explained. And, and I get a joy from writing that kind of scene. Um, so I, I know mm. I've talked about Majesty before. But if Matan was here, he could be my cheering squad is basically what I was getting at because he he knows I've got these four big fight scenes. But I think you've all maybe heard the uh, my opening fight scene, yeah. which, which is that same style of it is very this, than this, than this. And I, I think when done well, that can really work. And it, it's I guess it's always a taste thing. Someone may sit down and read that and they're like, there's a lot of detail. This is off-putting. And I guess that's why I put it as my opening chapter because I'm like, this this is the genre this book is. Mm. Um, so if you're not a fan of, you know, fight scenes mm -hmm. being the narrative, this is probably not going to be the book for you. <laughs> is anyone else thinking Dragon Ball Z during all oh, of this? Oh, absolutely. Because, like fighters narrative, like mm, that's the chef's kiss. In it is the pinnacle, sure. I'd say. At least yeah, in the, the Western world, yeah. I'd say. Oh. Um, well, I, what I was going to say about uh, the, also about the uh, the short stories, part of the compilation that we'd done um, was it, it is very much the opposite of that. Like the action scene, it's this one thing where like it's a zombie story and these kids have to get from one end of a tunnel to the other end of a tunnel. And you guys have all read it multiple times, but for the audience, um, there's this there's this one scene where all like they they basically the kids have to go across this chasm essentially where it's like oh we have to run past the zombies so it's like essentially a game of hide and seek for a second and then it gets to the last one and i really zoom in on his specific journey over it and i think it goes for about a page and it's just like every step he takes every breath and it's so and it's action but it's it's like that tension building action and then funnily enough when um when the actual spoiler alert when, when he he gets got um basically it does then become a little bit more abstract and impressionistic because there's you know just limbs going everywhere and blood like i think i use like this phrase a like, geyser of blood which in retrospect <laughs> seems uh seems a little gratuitous but it's, Ali, you fun. Like it, it's so. a fun phrase you lent in else. it was good yeah thank you um but yeah at, at that point when when everything's going higgledy piggledy and you, you can't quite make it out because the character's back there it then does sort of zoom back and become more of a melange of just craziness mm. um yeah, so I guess that's that's uh, two two versions of those different things being sort of interspliced. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, so Phoenix, were you going to say something? I was yeah, I was going to say it feels like it comes down to you, you have to be honest on what you've deserved. Like if you come in, because it's like action is a really powerful tool to bring readers in, but it can also be very exhausting. Because if you're reading yes. blow by blow, you That's can't true. do it for very long. Like it's, yeah, it has it, which I actually like the parallel because it's like a battle is exhausting to read as it is to fight. Well, I've never been in a battle, but I imagine. But uh, so it's like, you know, if you're starting off, if it's unearned heavy blow by blow, the reader's gonna get disinterested. Why do I care? Why do yeah. I care about every step this character is yeah. taking? So if like you haven't done the work, to set it up and create the tension, then it's not time for an action scene. It is a release that needs to be set up. Yeah, exactly. That was exactly my point at the beginning was it really has to be earned and it really has to be deserved. Otherwise it's like, why are you, what's, you know, what's going on here? Like if yeah, you've got like a five page fight scene, um, I mean, depending on different things, it, it might 
it, yeah, it, it can be exhausting. Um, I think, guys, it's probably time to move on to the reading, unless anyone has anything else. That, so yes. much more I want to say, but there's so right. much to say. Right. We almost need a episode two. I, yeah, maybe I we can part two this. <laughs> we can part two this. Yeah, yeah, this could be a thing. It just uh, got part, part two. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to squeeze in. Uh, one example because I'm currently watching it at the moment. It's an anime called Haikyuu and it's all about volleyball. Um, nice. And the reason I wanted to, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to bring it up because an, oh, it's anime. an example of action shonen that isn't fight scene, but it will do ten episodes of a single volleyball match. <laughs> and oh my I just gosh. Want you to, so dragon. I want you to comprehend. <laughs> the level of plotting detail that goes into creating oh. all turning points and emotional beats That's so for fun. one volleyball match. <laughs> it is a wow. masterclass in pacing. Like the, my household's been watching it and it'll do that really rude thing where it ends on a cliffhanger every time. So we watch yeah. four episodes, like we watch not four episodes, four hours of volleyball an evening. Like it is so binge worthy. <laughs> Just because you're like, I don't know if he's been practicing that dig technique. I can't go to bed until I know he succeeds in digging the ball up against that one asshole he's been making eye contact with. Like the stakes are so simple because it's like win the volleyball match, lose the volleyball match. So it doesn't even need to spend time setting any of that up. It's just yeah, it's right. all character and it's That's all awesome. action. Um, so I highly recommend Haikyuu. Awesome. I incidentally, with that little technique you said of like, you know, ending on a cliffhanger, which I, I read a book recently, there was a haunted house thing and it did it every, every single chapter. And yeah, it's, it's annoying, but I call that goosebumpsing because it's like, that's how every goosebumps book chapter ended like every single time, which is fair enough because it's for kids, but like, yeah. it works, but it works. It works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, true, true, true. If it's used sparingly. Um, all right, cool. I think I might jump into it if any, if, if no one else has anything immediately they want to say. I'm sure we, we all have more things. But yes, this particular reading is uh, from the Conan the Barbarian series. Uh, you may have seen the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is pretty fun. Um, this is based on the, it's, it's essentially a, a series of short stories and um, people kind of whinge about his writing being a little bit uh, over the top and, you know, gratuitous and you know, lots of adjectives and things. But the you'll you'll see what I mean, just the excitement and enthusiasm in it that you get from it. And this is specifically a, a fight scene where people are invading King Conan's bedroom to try and kill him. Um, you'll kind of get a sense of, of how uh, how well he's able to thread that enthusiasm into this action. So, uh, the king glared, puzzled as to their identity. Ascalante, he did not know. He could not see through the closed visors of the armoured conspirators, and Ronaldo had pulled his slouch cap down above his eyes. But there was no time for surmise. With a yell that rang to the roof, the killers flooded into the room. Grommel first. He came like a charging bull, head down, sword low for the disemboweling thrust. Conan sprang to meet him, and all his tigerish strength went into the arm that swung the sword. In a whistling arc, the great blade flashed through the air and crashed onto the Bosonian's helmet. Blade and cask shivered together, and Grommel rolled lifeless onto the floor. Conan bounded back, still gripping the broken hilt. Grommel, he spat, his eyes blazing in amazement as the shattered helmet disclosed the shattered head. Then, the rest of the pack were upon him. A dagger point raked along his ribs between breastplate and backplate. A sword edge flashed before his eyes. He flung aside the dagger wielder with his arm and smashed his broken hilt like a cestus into the swordsman's temple. The man's brains splattered into his face. Watch the door, five of you, screamed Ascalante, dancing about the edge of the singing steel whirlpool. Singing steel whirlpool, that's amazing. For he feared that Conan might smash through their midst and escape. The rogues drew back momentarily as their leader seized several and thrust them towards the single door. And in that brief respite, Conan leapt to the wall and tore therefore, uh, therefrom an ancient battle axe, which untouched by time had hung there for half a century. With his back to the wall, he faced the closing ring for a flashing instant, then leapt into the thick of him. He was no defensive fighter. Even in the teeth of overwhelming odds, he always carried the war to the enemy. Any other man would have already died there, and Conan himself did not hope to survive, but he did ferociously wish to inflict as much damage as he could before he fell. His barbaric soul was ablaze, and the chants of old heroes were singing in his ears. So that gives you a 
Oh yeah, that's like violence porn. It's violence yeah. porn. Wow. Best. It's just so so gratuitous in the best. As the way. shattered helmet disclosed the shattered head. Brain oh. splashed up onto his face. It was just yeah. Oh, the twelve-year-old boy in me actually really likes this. Yeah, I, know, I, I, I know. really need to read Conan. It is. It's totally over the top. But if mm. you can lean into that and be like, oh yeah, oh, easily. Yeah. It's, yeah, no. I I just read it within like a couple of pages. I was like, oh yeah, no, I know, I know what this is about. I, yeah. I, I yeah. Um, yeah. So so that's that's that. Um, well, I guess we can finish off with our quote then. And I believe Ali Burnham was going to yeah. read this one. I, I have a quote here um, about writing sex scenes. Oh, how is my internet? Sorry, before I begin. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Very good. Um, that I found both amusing and potentially insightful. Um, it comes to us KM Sonime, Sonime, sorry if I've got that wrong. I have even taught classes on writing about sex and I've looked closely at different writers' sex scenes. On the level of craft, I've given it a lot of thought. The pitfalls are simple. It can sound clinical or medical, which isn't right, or pornographic because the characters disappear. That was a really good way of kind of the, the, mm. the two spectrums that mm. a sex scene could fall on. <laughs> and it can happen the same with, with uh, regular action as well. You know, yeah. some, something can be too clinical and too blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah. the, his, his sword tilted slightly to the left and <laughs> went into the, the bottom rib and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. too medical. It's and like, we also know what a pornographic wow. fight scene yeah, reads like happened. as well. <laughs> that, was, that was probably pretty close, but uh, I don't know. I still enjoyed that. Um, yeah, <laughs> was no, I, yeah, 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 cool. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll that'll do us. We can we can wrap it up. Um, I don't think we we really have a closing thing. I guess the quote's meant to be the closing thing, isn't it? But um, no, no. Social media. Uh, Does any of us have any social media they want to plug? I don't. Um, I I have been doing a bit of stuff on Reddit recently under the name The Eldridge Horror. Um, so if you're interested in reading some horror stories, have a look at that. E L D R I D G E. -E. E -E. Yes. yes, the Eldridge, Eldridge, like Eldridge, but Eldridge horror, and all one word, all under there like that. Um, yeah, and look out for our uh, anthology. By the time this is out, uh, it will probably be getting, getting pretty close to the release date, I imagine. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's exciting. Other than that, guys, our socials and website will be live. So make sure to sign up to our newsletter so you'll be posted on details about when the anthology is coming out. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. We'll nail it one day. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Prespice Fiction Podcast.